sculpture. So we're going to be casting on just a whole variety of sculpture. Um, and then toward the end, see the uh, unit over there. That's a miniature Bessemer component. Uh, Keystone Ironworks is a program that springs from a grant through Lackawanna County and Arts Engage to work with at-risk high school students. Um, and we thought a great way to work with at-risk students was to give them something really dangerous to do. So the tribes go from town to town and they set things on fire. Perfect safety record. <laughs> <laughs> we sort of immediately went to the furnace site asking if we could play down there because it's such a great it's such, it's such a really magic opportunity to be in an industrial site doing the process as artists when it was, you know, the first industry in Scranton, really. It's the only place like it in the world. Um, there are other stone iron furnaces, uh, you know, on the East Coast and in the kind of northern part of the country. Uh, but this is the uh, only one that's constructed in, in this, this uh, kind of mm -hmm. special manner. Um, so it's a, a really, really unique place. My name is Nikki Moser. I am co-founder, along with Pat McGowan, of Keystone Ironworks. I, I teach at Keystone now, but we, our students go up to a poor at Binghamton University. There's sort of a little, these little cult followings that happen, these little cult meetings that happen, or tribe meetings, and that's where we met Vaughn. I preferred tribe rather than cult. Tri right? yeah, tribe <laughs> is a better word. When did I meet you guys? In 2009? Nine, eight. And I had, uh, well, I'm Vaughn Randall, by the way, and uh, <laughs> I had uh, have been developing a program down in Birmingham, Alabama at a similar National Historic Landmark, uh, which is uh, Sloss Furnaces, and uh, had come up here to teach. I now teach over in New York at, uh, at SUNY Cortland, teach sculpture there, and uh, just got invited through the community, these guys, and. You know the, the sort of a connected circuit of iron casters in around the country um, to come up here and work at this furnace. When everybody got together to do this industrial arts festival, which is like you know 20 or 25 partners that sit on this arts on fire thing, we really um, you know we had started a relationship with um, Chester Kalesa of the Anthracite Museum and Dan Perry at LHVA and. We really recognized that the site was kind of in trouble financially from the from the state, and this was an opportunity for us to kind of engage the community in in sort of this marvelous you know ruin that sits here in town on this beautiful landscape of Roaring Brook, and you know how do we how do we get everybody kind of mobilized to save this place and sort of recognize its place in history? I mean, we were talking about you know the Scrantons founded this city, but it's the Scranton brothers who came in and built this furnace, you know, so it's not, it's, it's the industrial heritage of this area. And, um, and those guys were really supportive from the very beginning mm -hmm. about, you know, how just, I mean, it's, it's unusual to be allowed to do this in a national historic landmark, you know, we get to play in the sandbox. <laughs> it's like, it's kind of great. So that's how we got started. We kind of stole that idea from you. We sort of heard about a program Vaughn was doing in Alabama, and uh, we got the, this grant and and there we went. The Friday night event uh, didn't start to the second year. Second right? year. Um, and the, the whole kind of concept for the Friday night event came out of um, uh, uh, the desire to first of all expand the festival. To, to, to kind of highlight um, what artists, what cast iron artists do and how they work together as a group because like we were just saying, it's a very, very group oriented activity. Um, so this not only gives our students uh, the day before um, a example of how professional artists work together and help, uh, help each other produce their artwork, um, it kind of shows them uh, you know, a, a live performance of how this is actually done. They've been learning about it and we've been talking about it and they've seen pictures and videos and the whole nine yards, but they haven't uh, seen it uh, in person yet. Uh, it does uh, have a certain element of danger to it. Um, the metal is obviously uh, very hot, um, but there's a lot of other kind of, um, I guess you could say, hidden dangers involved. It's a kind of controlled <laughs> danger. Um, yeah. Doing a process like this, um, but uh, 
you know, even uh, I, I think we were just having this conversation the other day. Um, it seems like sometimes uh, while the metal casting part is dangerous, the kind of parts leading up to that <laughs> are, are, are sometimes more dangerous. Sometimes, uh, uh, more dangerous, um, namely uh, breaking uh, iron and setting up uh, all this uh, uh, materials and, and heavy equipment and uh, lifting and moving and, and getting all this stuff in place um, is, is pretty involved and um, uh, kind of requires a lot of uh, preparation and, and carefulness, I think. But that's the great thing about the classes for the students is, and, and really the whole process of casting, mold making, is that at every step you're learning a new process. And so the molds, you, know, you start out with something that's manageable on your own, but you know the next thing you know in the studio, you need someone to help you lift that mold and move it over, and then you need someone to help you get it bundled up. So by the time we get the students through the process, they've already kind of built a nice little team and we can start to trust them and they see us working together and mentoring them and our students mentoring the younger students and there's this kind of layering of them. So by the time we get to that point where it's dangerous, they've got a lot of trust and kind of responsibility built up that they don't even really realize yet. You know, and then they, the Friday night offers them an opportunity to watch us out there together and it's surprisingly quiet, I think. It's sort of like a weird ballet that happens. Like everybody kind of knows what they're supposed to be doing. Mm. And it makes, you know, it, the everybody's safety is in everyone else's hands, so everyone's very respectful of that. Sometimes it's more important to step back and, and hold a shovel, <clears throat> not because you're being lazy, but because you're looking for something that could go wrong, mm. like a power <clears throat> line out of place or a gas line out of place or some things like that. So that uh, so that we keep each other safe. The very first pour on Sunday, a professional team does the pour, and we have the students grouped up in teams, and each student on that team is watching a point person, so they know that they're either skimming or they're on the dead end or the live end of the ladle, so they watch that person, and then before they go out there, you know, it's are you confident and comfortable doing that and they know who their backup person is and you know they know which of us to come look to for help so it's really it's really organized in a very tight system and and all and, and sometimes you have students who do this and then sometimes you have students who are like I want to do that I said I didn't want to but now I want to you never know which one's going to be <laughs> you don't that's kind of the great part sometimes you get a kid who's been terrified the whole time and they get out there and it's just like, totally step up yeah. right so great. Obviously again from the images it's uh, very very hot. Um, mostly all the, the safety gear is uh, made out of leathers. Um, it's a, uh, an apron or um, uh, a bib apron that has legs that you uh, uh, put on uh, a heavy leather jacket, um, boot spats that cover over the bottom part of your leg and the top of your feet. Um, Heavy, uh, heavy welding gloves, uh, a hard hat, a, a face shield, uh, safety glasses underneath that, of course, and um, I guess several other things that are optional. Um, it's kind of uh, very critical to, to have this stuff on. Um, uh, iron has a kind of nasty habit of when it gets on your skin, rolling. And, going into crevices and mm -hmm. shoelaces <laughs> and uh, pockets and that, uh, and it just kind of keeps uh, keeps burning. Uh, so it's just uh, something that's very nasty that you, you don't want to get on you. Um, and uh, the leather has a, a kind of a, a good, good way of letting that roll off and bounce off of you. So that's what, there's a bunch of molds just, we've just been pulled. But you can see the molds, some of the molds are, we because everything was so wet on Friday night, we um, put everything up on pallets, which is great, except that pallets catch fire when exposed to molten iron. So there was a lot of this was pallets that we were trying to put sand on, but we, you know, we had a, we got like four dump loads of sand that day, like a lot more sand than we've ever brought in because of the rain. But you know, they're digging down in there, putting sand on pallets to put them out, and then that's taking away our pathways. And you know, everybody's trying to keep all of that kind of mitigated. 
becomes a, a tricky situation dealing with the weather and type of weather. Yeah. That's a mold that's been poured and um, the vents are just off, it's just gas burning it's off, just right? just gas is burning off. It's down like 2,700 degrees, so when you pour it into a mold or any, anything, if there's anything that will burn, it will burn. Yeah, you can put a shovel up against a, a mold that's cracked and kind of cool that metal off and it'll sort of self-heal sometimes. 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 Or you theory. just walk or away. Or it'll burn through the <laughs> or it'll burn through the shovel. Yeah. That's we love that craftsman. A big, yeah, <laughs> big scallop melted out of your Sears shovel. Sears doesn't really like it when you return a shovel with a hole burned through it. But they will honor their guarantee. It says lifetime warranty right on the handle. Yeah, but they just look at the shovel and shake their head. Um, but it's also really great fun. Again, for a lot of us, it's, it's the opportunity to get your own work made, too, because we've all got molds out there on the floor, so we want to make sure everything goes well so they all get cast. and. Bessemer converter is was developed um, the by Henry Bessemer. Well, well, <laughs> well into the Bessemer, so right? here's the Bessemer converter. Okay, so uh, the true Behind story of the Bessemer there. converter is it was developed by an American named William Kelly, and I believe William Kelly is somewhere from Pennsylvania, uh, and it was stolen theoretically. This is the story I read a book called The True Story, <laughs> converter, um, written by William Kelly. Um, <laughs> apparently, he was uh, he was his idea was stole technical, and it's not. It's what it does is like, here's the short thing: uh, you put metal in the converter, and then you blow air up through it, and it burns out all the impurities, mm -hmm. leaving iron. It shouldn't. It shouldn't look like, quite <laughs> like that. This was a slight ball. malfunction, but a very beautiful malfunction. Yeah. What's the guy's name that made this one? Josh. 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 Dow. Josh Dow. Where's he from? He's in the Preds. Uh, he's a very good man, knows a lot about what he's doing. And what happened Solid was, guy. is he needed to make the lining thin so he could take it on the road. And it's it just didn't hold. Uh, <laughs> and we felt so bad because he's such a nice guy. Um, so yeah, the theory is he's making steel out of gray iron. This year, something very exciting is coming in. It's an exhibition called Iron Maidens. And Iron Maidens, this is its sixth or seventh stop internationally. It's been shown a few times in, uh, in Wales and in England and um, in the United States. And it's a group of female cast iron sculptors. It's a group show. It will be on the first and second floor of AFA Gallery. And then also on the second floor, because this year is our second National Endowment for the Arts Award. This year we got an Our Town grant, and Our Town is about community placemaking, so we're doing a kind of photographic retrospective of how starting this with the whole Arts on Fire group um, really reinvigorated this site and is beginning to re reinvigorate this whole area of Southside. So it's really about community making and placemaking. Um, so we're looking at a kind of retrospective, because now the Furnace is a really viable site. There are weddings down there and a, and a um, uh, farm stand, farm market, what do you call it? Farm market farm on the market. weekends and they're doing yeah. uh, festival in October. They're doing the big bonfire in October mm -hmm. and they're also doing movies down there. So the site which was slated to become a ghost is now breathing again and that's really it's, it's really exciting for us. So um, so we want you to come and play with us. <laughs> Is it June 6th, 7th, and 8th? 6th and 7th? I believe so. <laughs> 6th, 7th, and 8th. <laughs> Friday night, uh, tickets are $15. Cold Town Rounders are playing. It will be fabulous fun. There will be food and beer. Saturday, the festival, it runs from something like 10 to 6. And all of our students will be pouring their work. And we'll have 200 scratch blocks available for the community. And then Sunday, there are also our festivities down there. There are craft vendors and food vendors and uh, fire jugglers and musicians and all kinds of things to do. So it's really the whole weekend. We want you to come on Sunday to um, come see the fire Friday and Saturday to Saturday maybe you can get a closer look at what's going on. Friday night just come for the fireworks and the yeah. beer yeah. <laughs> and the music. Gold Down Rounders are playing. Um, <laughs> 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 <laughs>
There, there are a huge list of thank yous that I, I, if I started to list everyone, I'm sure that I would omit someone, but certainly all of the partners on the Arts on Fire, which includes Lackawanna County and Arts Engage and EOTC and the Toy Museum and Anthracite Museum and LHVA, um, lots of our sponsors um, who donate a host of materials and safety equipment year after year, just with like the most gracious. I mean, like we call now and people are just like, oh, I went last year, it was fantastic. You know, and they just, and they're like, here, ha you know, take this. Everyone is so generous with us and, and people who donate their time to work on the festival. And, um, you know, it, it's like we, ha we have this little job to do when we're there, but around us is this army of people who are running the festival and making sure that everything is as it should be. And I think we would be remiss if we didn't add Keystone College to the list, certainly. And I think uh, we should thank Liz Ratchford and Sharon sure, Burke, sure. who are the original grant writers who got us the very first grant and who then got us the first uh, NEA grant that we got last year, and then the one that we got, or the one that we got two years ago, and then the second NEA grant that we want. So we should thank the NEA Absolutely. too. I think. <laughs> who did mm -hmm. I miss? And all of the people who come, Vaughn, and who brings his students, and Coral, and the tribe from Baltimore. Who did I miss? They're going to be mad. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I meant to say thank you to all of you. Thank you. Oh. We wish for a permanent. How much video do you have? <laughs> we would like Jib a permanent crane, sand pit, a chip crane. Pouring box, a big sandbox. Uh, maybe just a 3,000 square foot studio mm -hmm. right down there where we could run classes out of. So we could have, and then we could actually offer classes to adults because we have tons of adults Good who awesome. come up and say, wow, I would totally love to do that. And we can only, through the grant, only offer it as um, for our high school students. You know, and we wish our high school students well. We wish our high school students to be like really, you know, we want this to change the course of their life in a really good way. And we want permanent facility. We want to keep our perfect safety record. What mm -hmm. else is on our wish list? <laughs> um, permanent facility, yeah. Permanent facility would be incredible. List. Yeah, it would be really wonderful for us to be able to. I mean, like I think one of you know we're. What we didn't talk about is some of these pieces that we're making are being donated to a sculpture park that is just starting in um, Scranton called Confluence and it's a partnership with LHVA and Keystone College. But also if we could have a permanent facility, we could kind of reinvigorate that neighborhood and really put in programming that serves a multitude of people and really you know, it encourages this tradition of craftsmanship and collaboration and community and partnership and I think um, we could do a really good job of it if they just give us a building. <laughs>